Aerialus. Aerialus. Only an anachronism. a lot of the same things. The law teaching travel, music, and a meal with family and friends. Eugene Scalia wrote, they have a bond, I think, in that they both grew up as outsiders to different degrees to the elites who ruled the country, she as a Jew and a woman, he as a Catholic and Italian American. Read. They shared love of opera, or they shared love of opera was on display in 1994. Shortly after being Bird, a Bill Clinton nominee joined Scalia, a Ronald Reagan nominee, on the Supreme Court. They appeared together as extras in the Washington National Opera's opening night production of Richard Richard Strauss's Arine de Also, Years later, they began the subject of Scalia Ginsburg, Derek Wang's 2014 comic opera inspired by their legal opinions. It opens with Galia's rage area. Uh, Ginsburg recalled a few years ago, he sings, the justices are blind, how can they possibly spot this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this, <coughs> to which he responded that the Constitution, like society, can evolve. Well, I'll read. The two justices appeared together many times over the years. When tickets went on sale in 2015 for a joint appearance at George Washington University, the first 350 tickets were scooped up in less than three hours. Those occasions exhibited the many traits they had in common. They were fellow New Yorkers, Ginsburg having grown up in Brooklyn, Scalia in Queens. They were fellow academics, Scalia having taught at the University of Virginia and University of Chicago Law Schools, Ginsburg, <coughs> at Rutgers, and Columbia. Their, bound, their bond was cemented at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, the most common stepping stone to the Supreme Court. Ginsburg served there from 1980 to 1993, Scalia from 1982 to 1986. From our years together at the D.C. Circuit, we were best buddies, Ginsburg said, following her colleague's death. At Scalia's memorial service in 2016, Ginsburg recounted the story of how, when she was writing the High Court's majority opinion striking down the VMI's ban on admitting women, Scalia showed her his unfinished dissent. It was a zinger, filled with disdainful footnotes, she said, but I was glad to have the extra days to adjust the court's opinion. My final draft was much improved thanks to Justice Scalia's searing criticism. To sum up their friendship, she quoted Scalia, I attack ideas, I don't attack people. Some very good people have some very bad ideas. Then later that year, in her memoir, My Own Words, she summed it up in her own way. How blessed I was, she wrote, to have a working colleague and dear friend of such captivating brilliance, high spirits, and quick wit. So, What should they teach us? Their relationship with each other. What should that teach us? Morgan. Like, don't attack the person when they think of all the By the way, for those that have taken my speech class, what fallacy is that? It's a logical fallacy. Close. It means that in Latin. It means ad hominem, to the person. And sadly, so many, and I see this on Facebook, I see this even with political candidates, okay? I see this where people are attacking the person rather than attacking the policy. And these two, I think, found a great way to distinguish between the two. Wanda? That's right. Now, why is it 
Why are we so divided? Because I was even, uh, a soccer team had a road trip on Saturday and I was chatting with everyone's favorite sub teacher, Mr. Heisman, who was the bus driver. Quite something, that guy. Anyway, I asked him, because there's so much in politics, and I said, have you ever seen the country more divided than now? He lived through the 1960s. 1960s were dramatic, and he said, not even close. This is the most divided I have ever seen the nation. Why are we so divided? We don't try to understand each other. What a great answer. Say that one more time a little louder. We don't try to understand each other's ideas. To be able to empathize and try to understand the perspective that they come from is one of the best things a democracy should have and desperately needs. Brandon. Yeah, that's a critical thing. Any other reasons? Then I'll point out a few. And Lapsley and Rhett are front row seats for this, okay? You look at it, and a few reasons why we are so divided politically, okay? Number one, we have two political parties that are moving in different directions. There is a Pew poll. Pew is a polling organization, and they kind of keep track of how the Democrat Party is evolving on different policies over time and how the Republican uh, party is evolving over the same period of time. It is amazing, just in the last 10 years, just in the last 10 years, you have seen, in terms of the policies of Republicans, for example, 10 years ago, Republicans were ardently, strongly for free trade. Is Donald Trump for free trade? Not necessarily. You had many people, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, who were actually very much in favor of much greater immigration, because after all, that means more workers coming into the nation. That was the rationale. Donald Trump is not necessarily that man. You've seen an evolution in terms of Republican beliefs moving rightward in some ways. Then, as far as Democrats, you have also seen huge changes occurring as well. You have even, let's say, Chuck Schumer. Who is Chuck Schumer? General Patton? He's the Senate Minority Leader. If you look at his quotes from 2012, 2010, he was in favor of building a wall. Yeah, that was a common belief, we need to build a wall. But even on other issues, do you know who actually, who entered office as the first president in favor of gay marriage? What president was the first to enter office supporting gay marriage? Trump, Trump actually. He's in favor of gay marriage. President Obama did not, but he eventually came to support it about halfway through his administration. <laughs> you have something that in the 1990s would never, actually the Democrats passed in the 1990s a uh, Defense of Marriage Act. Can't remember the anachronism or the uh, whatever. But the evolution that both parties have had in terms of policy going in the different direction, it's much harder to actually find compromise when your policies are so very, very, very divergent. Thankfully, it's, we've somehow managed to do it in terms of budgets and whatnot, but one reason is you have different political parties moving in different directions. It's very hard to actually compromise now. Second, the news media and social media, how might those not necessarily be great in terms of our political <coughs> Carly? Yeah. Yeah. People not thinking for themselves. Yeah, people not thinking for themselves. Why not? How might social media or news media not be very helpful? Ashley. You can try to persuade. Sometimes I debate if my attempts at persuasion are even working. Write this down. Echo chamber. What Desiree just said there is, oftentimes, 
people will only search out the news that confirms their own opinions. This is called an echo chamber. What is an echo chamber? Any guesses? Rhett? Imagine being in a small room, echoey room, okay, and all of the information that you're hearing is just confirming what you're hearing. Those echoes will get louder and louder, and you'll be more and more and more convinced that your position is right. If you're only searching out Republican stuff, or only searching out Democrat stuff, then you're going to get more and more and more entrenched in your position. <coughs> Republicans only read Daily Wire or Fox News or watch Fox News. Democrats only watch MSNBC or read Huffington Post. Without searching the other ideas out, it's also a problem because people are no longer actually searching out objective news. How else would, let's say, social media drive the nation apart? Sydney. How? How does it distort the truth? I agree, but how? Um, like, you can have a level of culture out there, a local capacity. Yeah. Jonathan? People are more likely to be like partial on social media so they can see more of like what's going on. Like, this one party, no basis, just yelling at the other parties. Why would people be more harsh on social media? Carly? <laughs> They can hide behind the screen, they can type something nasty and then disappear. And you don't actually have to have a conversation face to face. There are some crazy views out there. I think one of the most recent ones, the, the justice that probably will be nominated by Trump. Her name is Amy Coney Barrett. I've already talked about her before. And I have a good friend of mine who's very, very liberal. And I think uh, he's part of many radical groups on Facebook, or and he just puts memes out all the time. Uh, but one of them was, Amy Coney Barrett is a white supremacist who believes her job is to bring back the KKK. That was basically what it was yesterday morning. I'm like, wow. Little does he know that she actually adopted two kids from Haiti. She loves those children, I assume, regardless of the color of their skin. There's a lot of misinformation, and sadly, the nastiness level, hiding behind a screen, is amplified with social media. Honestly, I'm, I wonder if I will allow my children to get on social media, because I really don't think there's a lot of good that can come from it. I don't know. Maybe you guys can convince me, but that'll be a discussion for another day. Yes. Third, the primary process. This is a small one but it's also accurate that you look at it and those people, so the way the elections work is, let's say you take a senator, okay, from Indiana. When, who are our two senators, by the way? Ed. Ed Charbonneau is the state senator, not senator to the actual Washington, D.C. Maybe that's your homework. Tell me who our two senators are. But anyway, let's take a senator from the state of Indiana. When we actually have a Senate from Indiana, and he is going to be a Republican, uh, the last Democrat was actually in office just as late as 2018, so Indiana isn't always red. But those people that vote in the Republicans, who's voting to choose that candidate? Jake Peterson and I were talking about this earlier. Who's actually voting in these primaries? Is it the moderate voters? Is it the left-wing voters? Is it the right-wing voters? It is the people who vote in primaries, whether it's a Democrat candidate or Republican candidate, the moderate voters are not the ones that are voting. It is the super hardcore Republicans or the super hardcore liberals. So what candidates do you get? more hardcore to the right or to the left, thus making it more and more difficult to actually find moderates. You need moderates in order to have compromise. And the last one, I said in the first unit, one of the key things you need to understand about politics and the relationship of the church to politics is, politics is significant, but not what? Sovereign. For many people, politics is a religion. They live and die by the events that happen with politics. This is why you have 
whether it's Republicans who were nasty to Obama or Democrats who, uh, I think there was right after Trump was inaugurated, I saw a video of a lady who was down on her knees. She was probably like, I don't know, 500 yards, 1,000 yards from where Trump was inaugurated, down on her knees, and when she heard Trump say uh, the oath that he was sworn in, she just, ah, like that. It's just like somebody just died. Genocide is happening or something like that. I don't know. I'm not sure. But you look at it, and for many people, politics is their life. That's what it is. And what Ginsburg and Scalia, I think, can teach us more than anything is politics is significant, but it's not sovereign. You can still love the person and dislike the policy. And sometimes we need to take the personal out of our discussion and just talk reasonably about policy, about how we disagree. Because honestly, the crazy thing about it is, is that there are a shocking number of similarities between Republicans and Democrats if we actually sat down and talked. If we actually sat down and talked, do let's say Republicans hate inner city kids? Maybe there's a few, because there's always bad people out there. But no, when they want to, let's say, cut some of the funding to inner city schools. Why are they doing that? Because they want charter schools to have that money and have greater competition in schools. When Republicans are saying, let's try to reform and cut Medicare, is that because they hate old people? No, it's because our nation is massively in debt. And when you guys get old enough, Medicare and Social Security are not going to be there for you. We have a nation that just demonizes the other side without actually listening to the other side. So to go back to it, to go back to the article, at the bottom there, what is the relevance of this topic to us today? What is the relevance for this moment? What do I have listed below there? You've seen these phrases before. What do I have listed below there? Branton? Close. At the first unit, I talked about the key principles that make the Constitution a great document. The six principles. Judicial review and separation of powers and limited government. The other side of that, though, is if you want a successful democracy, not only do you have to have a government set up in the proper way, but you also need a population that is capable of handling a democracy. And increasingly, and sadly, our nation is coming to a point where we are too divided. Look at this list. I'll read it. You tell me how many of them actually reflect the American nation today. Recognition of the fundamental worth and dignity of every person. A respect for the equality of all persons. A faith in majority rule and an insistence upon minority rights. An acceptance of the necessity of compromise. An insistence upon the widest possible degree of individual freedom while acknowledging each person's responsibility to society. Adherence to a proper moral code and an active participation in popular sovereignty. Now, if you were to compare us with Saudi Arabia, clearly we are more equipped at democracy. But considering from where we came, and let's say the decade after Martin Luther King, who said this, these are the only ways we can actually reconcile racial differences, these things, does that reflect us today? I'm not sure. And that's why, are we going to fix this divide that exists in our nation just from the top? from Biden, if he's the president, just fixing things, or Trump somehow fixing things, putting down Twitter and being nicer suddenly? Are we going to fix it from the top? No. The only way we fix it is if the American public starts exhibiting some of, these, some of this respect, some of this emphasis on equality, some of this getting to know one another, even going back to what Alba said at the beginning, empathizing with one another. That's how you have a successful democracy. And I think that's what Ginsburg and Scalia can highlight to us. 
10.15 now. As a reminder, campaign materials due Thursday, VP speech Friday, debate the following Monday. You can work in your groups. I'm not giving you full days anymore to work on that, so make sure you're making progress. That is all. Uh, yeah, hold on to it until at least the uh, test. DJ, you're ugly.